Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. We're continuing on with our South Wales walking tours. We're delighted to bring you something a little bit different today and our explorers at Blenhaven Ironworks where you're able to find out how the materials were made and how they were used. You can walk back in time inside some of the iron workers cottages and discover their story that's told through cutting edge interpretation. The site lies at the heart of an industrial landscape. It's so unique that it's been made a world heritage site. Join us for a wonder and more. The history of Blenhaven Ironworks is an iconic manufacturing landscape in a small Welsh town. It begins in 1782 and the land where it stands is owned by the Lord of Abergavenny. He went on to lease the land to three Midland based businessmen. They were Thomas Hill, Thomas Hopkins and Benjamin Pratt. They all decided to build a huge and impressive ironworks with multiple blast furnaces. This took a number of years to build and it opened in 1789. They used steam power and it was the second largest ironworks in Wales and later on was producing over 5,400 tonnes of iron a year. You can still see the horse-drawn railway tracks that connected the ironworks with the Abergavenny Canal. The first building that we enter is the foundry. This room would cast the iron directly from the furnaces 1 and 2 through the side arches near the back. Now it's a room with a lot of ironwork that's been stored safely. Some chimney towers, wheels and lovely ornate fireplaces are definitely something to explore. It would quickly become the key for international production and although Blenhaven had a small glitch in 1806 after Napoleon, the Emperor of France, introduced the continental system, this meant that the British Empire was blockaded from trading with the rest of Europe. But after the failure of the system, Blenhaven managed to produce and distribute its iron ore to the whole of the world, which caused an industrial bloom within the village, due to it being very rich in iron, coal and limestone. Following on from this, it was discovered that it would be considerably cheaper to make iron ore in Wales than elsewhere, due to its easily sought natural resources. They opened mines and quarries and dug for miles and miles, and houses were thrown up wherever they were needed. It was made to exploit the local reserves of coal and iron ore, and at its peak it employed thousands of men that worked day in and day out operating the huge blast furnaces and making pig iron, wrought iron and later steel. This would then fuel the Industrial Revolution and send British power around the world to keep it running. By the 1840s, thousands upon thousands of people had flocked to the Brecon Beacons, lured in by the new collieries and ironworks that was pushed to the forefront. Both lives and landscapes were transformed and by 1851, more Welsh people were employed in the industry than in agriculture giving Wales their claim to be the first ever industrial nation. Especially nowadays, in our modern times, it's thanks to those people, the local miners, who have paved a better and fairer future, some that we may take for granted nowadays, like our education, our pay and our good working hours. It's here at Blenhaven that one of the most important developments of the entire Industrial Revolution happened. One of the young chemists, Percy Gilchrist, along with his cousin Sidney, invented what's known as the basic or the Thomas process, which was a way to smelt the steel using iron ore, but first they lined the pit with limestone bricks. This was a way that you could create very high quality steel out of very poor quality iron. As we enter the cast house, I'll stop talking and give you a break whilst you can enjoy the on-site exhibition that allows you to see the interpretation and the reconstruction process that provided a fascinating insight into the social history of industrial Britain.
Although it wasn't just the adults who suffered, children as young as five were put to work. And in 1842, government inspectors discovered that over 185 children under the age of 13 were working at the ironworks and its surrounding mines. Standing in front of you, you can see the blast furnaces. These stone towers were built to withstand some serious heat, especially when you're considering the air pipes that add to that heat. And they would typically reach a piping hot temperature of 1,600 degrees Celsius. The blast furnaces are charged with iron ore and charcoal that's made from coal and limestone. The air would then blast at the bottom of the furnace and the calcium in the limestone would combine with the silicates to form what's known as slag. Liquid iron is then collected at the bottom of the furnace and it's let out to flow and cool. Once cooled down into a bed of sand, the metal is known as pig iron. The low walls in the front mark the former cast houses where the hot molten iron would run out and it was often taken away in wagons on the rail track lines around the site. Here is what's known as the balance tower. It was constructed to be a lift to connect the lower and upper yards, which was powered by the weight of water. It really is the main architectural feature of the ironworks, and it was built in 1839 by James Ashwell, who was at the time criticized for overspending on the construction of the tower. It was of course intended to take raw materials to the top area to the furnaces, but it also provided access to the export route through a tunnel 500 metres to the north. Unfortunately, it was cordoned off as it was flooded and we couldn't get access around and inside, but we are still able to marvel at the incredible stonework in the front. Stack Square was built between 1789 to 1792 to house part of its workforce. It is a U-shaped block of which the south row is known as engine row, with a truck stop at the southwest corner. It was originally known as Shop Square, but it acquired its more recent name when a boiler stack was built in the middle of the square in 1853. The two rows that make up the stack square incorporate houses of different sizes and statuses, some had upper floors with separate bedrooms and some were unfortunate and made do with smaller, more cramped bedrooms with no privacy. Amongst these cottages is a modern visitor centre that explores the history of iron making and the Blenavon site. There are scale models of the ironworks and the surrounding industrial areas, as well as a visit to the reconstructed company shop where the workers were able to spend their wages 
and clothe and feed their families. It's really beautifully repurposed and fascinating to see the old replicas and the difference to today's modern convenience store. It was also a sad reality that back in the day, these company shops kept their prices high and kept people in debt to the company. Workers were often not paid in cash, so they had no choice but to spend their tokens here.
One of our favourite bits was to visit the houses throughout the different eras letting you time travel across 200 years. It was incredible to see how every year things improved, adapted and became more furnished. Some of the objects you can see on show you might recognise having yourself. Or like us, it was a trip down memory lane, visiting the grandparents and seeing and playing with the items that were here. I think it's amazing how they've reconstructed these cottages and it's really eye-opening too, considering our luxuries nowadays. We haven't been everywhere here as we would absolutely want to encourage you to come explore and spend the day around Blenavon. And although we didn't get to visit the Big Pit or the World Heritage Centre, we would absolutely love for you to do that if you're in the area and if you're looking for something to get lost in. So a big thank you for watching. We hope you've enjoyed seeing around the site today. If you have, please hit that like button and consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks for joining us. Till next time.